launching the, the or not launching, uh, revisiting the whole Believe the Hype. And, but the, the appendage to that is you, you need help. <laughs> yeah, somebody looked at their neighbor. Glad you guys are back. I've been missing y'all. Somebody looked at their neighbor just then and said, you need help. They just kind of reiterated what I said. And the truth is, you do need help. I, I was on my way to, to uh, town yesterday. You know, we live way back in the sticks. And so when we drive anywhere, it's toward town. In fact, I grew up in rural Louisiana so far back in the woods, we had to walk toward town to hunt. That's, that's a long way. And so... I still live in rural Louisiana, and so we were, I was driving into town, and I looked out to my right. You know how things catch your eye, especially if you're an outdoors person? Things catch your eye, and I saw this baby calf. It was, it was a black calf with a white face. Its fur was wet. Its, its legs were wobbly. It, it looked so weary and well-doing because it was unstable. It was wobbling all over the place, and there was this huge buzzard about 10 feet away that was waiting to pluck his eyeballs out, ready to eat his flesh. It was like, and the little calf, he would try to face the buzzard, and it would just fall flat on its side. I mean, it was just, it, it couldn't have been born over 30 minutes. And so it was wobbling all over the place, and it, was, it looked so helpless. Did I tell you the mama calf was with it? Oh, that changes everything, doesn't it? In fact, did you know the calf was born with a mama calf? The, the mama calf gave birth to the calf. The mama cow gave birth to the calf, and so it had help there all along. It wasn't helpless. It, it had plenty of help available to it because the mama was there to nurture. In fact, I watched that mom for a long time. I did a U-turn, went back and watched it some more, and that mama would just stomp at that buzzard and shoo it away. And your life is not much different than that cast. Perhaps, obviously, you're a human being. You're the group that Jesus came to die for, and and resurrected for and ascended to the Father so he could send us some help. But, but the truth is, you're not much different than that calf. You need some help. We live in a world that's got major problems. I read a recent, a recent actually it's been over the last decade, but it said that the kids going into high school now, comparatively, this is from the American Psychological uh, Psychology Association, it said the kids entering high school now, the anxiety level is equivalent to mental patients of the 50s. And they are dealing with all kind of stuff. So we are dealing with all, if any generation in our lifespan is dealing with major problems, then we are dealing with those same problems. So the, the, the deal is you cannot ponder your problem. You have to ponder the promise. You can't meditate on the mess. You have to meditate on the master. You can't linger in the lousiness. You've got to linger in the Lord. The truth is, watch me. The truth is, you're going through hell, but there is help. That's the truth. That's the bottom line. Jesus, you know, you go back. We discovered last week that the Holy Spirit didn't just, all of a sudden, it just appeared out of nowhere. But we see it shown. We see it. We see little Little small, minute pieces of it, if that's the thing. I don't know that I can properly say that. That's theologically incorrect. You either got it or you got him or you don't have him, <laughs> right? But, but so there's not, but there is, there's emblems, there's theophanies, there's Christophanies, there's things that are showing us that Jesus is coming. There's things that are showing us that the Holy Spirit is, is, is going to be here. We, we see it when men were moved by the Holy Spirit. We see David. He's moved by the Holy Spirit. We see Samson. He's moved by the Holy Spirit. We see even a fire and a cloud that leads the children of Israel. That is the Holy Spirit. So it's not like just Wake up one morning, and there he is. The Holy Spirit is here. He's been showing himself all along. Just like we have water here. This water could be ice, but it could also be vapor. In fact, if you were to break down this room, there's probably about five gallons of water in this room if we could wring this room out. But nobody sees it. It's still water, though. It's still H2O. It's just in a different form. So God shows up. This triumphness of him shows up in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we see him. And we, we want to involve ourselves. The better thing is, is that he involves himself in our lives. This is where David said it this way. 
And I got to think, being the prophetic psalmist that he was, he said, I will lift my eye. Remember that psalm? I will lift my eyes to the hills, to quote the King James, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. And then he goes to delineate what this Lord does. The Lord who made heaven and earth. And then it says, he will not suffer. In other words, he will not leave me helpless. And so Jesus comes to this world. And he lives this wonderful life. And we have this snippet in the Bible of about three and a half years of his life where he's performing miracles. He's stopping funeral processions. He is he's unstopping blind eyes with a little bit of mud and spittle. And people start seeing. He, he tells truths that everybody knows. They've got pieces from the Torah and pieces from the from the radical teachings of the, of the sages of the past. And, and now he comes out and he embodies it. He, he lives it. He, he shows them how to explore it with his metaphors and with his, his teaching. And, and they, see, they see different angles of all these truths that have already been established in a law-like way. And now he's showing how this fits into humanity. That all of humanity needs help. So he's about to leave, and before it's over today, before we leave here, we're going to find the three most important chapters in the Gospels that preface and lead us up to the Holy Spirit coming to the earth. There's a whole preparatory area of the Bible that gets us ready for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit you're going to find today is nothing that you need to freak out over. It's, it's God. And it's God showing himself in a unique and a beautiful manifestation. So these people that Jesus talked to in these three chapters that we're going to discover here today, they needed help and they needed to go back and be reminded over and over in their days to come, just like you, what he had promised them. So the Holy Spirit comes with power. Say that with me. The Holy Spirit comes with power. Power. We talked about that power a little bit last week. But let's go to Acts chapter 2. Let's, let's delve in to what happened. And then you too can say what had happened was. So here it is. Here's the what had happened was moment in Acts chapter 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived. By the way, that word Pentecost is 50. There's a whole lot of lessons to be learned there. That, that it's just like the Pentagon. This is Pentecost uh, because it was expensive. It cost a man his life. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested. On each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions that come up. And that's why a lot of people just stay away. They just say well I'll take this part of the Bible. But nah, let's just get through that. And we'll get on, get on over here to even the book of Revelation. We'll talk about things we have no clue there. <laughs> but we'll just leave this alone. Uh, There's a lot of questions as to what was going on, including accusing them that we're about to find out of being drunk. So here's Peter's sermon. When this happens, it stirs a lot of questions. And let me just stop you just for a minute. Don't be alarmed when you have questions about the Bible. In fact, be alarmed if you don't. (laughs) In fact, somebody needs to just awaken you and make you realize that if you think you have all the answers when it comes to the scripture, I'll have to tell you one of the most, um, I say this in a reverence way, in a fearful things that I, I ever do and I've done most of my life is stand in this pulpit. And I, when I say fearful, I don't mean fearful in a, an afraid way, but in a respectful way. When I represent this book, I represent it very humbly and very carefully. I do not have all the answers, but I'm looking. In fact, the older I get, the more diligent I am and interested I am is about what does the Bible really say? Because there's a whole lot of people out there telling you this is what it said. And that's why anytime I know this for Pastor Marcus and any of our staff that stand in this podium, we are quick to tell you, don't just take our word for it. Read it in your Bible. 
Find it there for yourself. So this third, this happening at Pentecost, this, this expensive meeting happened. This, it happened and it caused a lot of questions. And, and here, so let's, let's read on in Acts 2 verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose. Didn't say they weren't drunk, just says they're not drunk as you suppose. Since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is that that was uttered through the prophet Joel. And here's what Joel said. Verse 17 morphs into a quotation. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit. Whose spirit? Come on, whose spirit? God's spirit. That's right. He's t- this is God talking through the prophet Joel. I, in the last days I will pour out my spirit. Some translations saying, I will pour out of my spirit. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see vision. So, ladies, there is hope. To the, many of, if you come out of a world, if you're old enough to remember when it was, let me just let me meddle a minute. When it was, where it was not equal rights. So here, here's your deal: to my sons and my daughters, they shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants then he gets into servants again equality here even on my male servants and female servants in those days i will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy and i will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the lord comes and the and excuse me a great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So I want to talk to you about some myths of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard some of them. Some of them, uh, I'll probably regret that I even shared them with you because now you have something else to think about. But for the sake of everyone in the room, I want to talk about some myths because it's true. We, we, we all conclude that we need some help, right? And so this is our, we're going to discover here today, this is our, there's four myths about the Holy Spirit that I want to hit briefly and I will hit them even briefer, I think you can say that, than I intended to. Number one, he is a ghost, so you should be afraid. It's a myth. He is a ghost. Romans 14, 17 teaches us that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The the kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace. So evidently the joy and the peace comes from the Holy Spirit. So that indicates to me real quickly without going into, there's plenty of other verses that verify this, that the Holy Spirit is not something you should be afraid of. Everybody say, he is my friend. All right. Myth number two, the only real evidence is speaking in tongues. Now, they did do that. We just read you the text where this did happen according to Acts 2, 4. Uh, They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Number three, myth number three, but there are other, uh, there, excuse me. I'm still on the same one. Let me, let me, let me. There are other evidences. Everybody say other evidences. So the other evidence is Galatians 5.22. You know them by common sense if you have any scriptural base at all that the fruit of the Spirit, you could, you could shout them, right? We just went through a whole series of the fruit of the Spirit. So there's other evidences to confirm and corroborate. They spoke the word with boldness according to Acts 4, a sign of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seals according to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, it, it's, it's prophesied. Prophecy happens under the unction of the Holy Spirit. They did speak in tongues under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verses 16 and 17, they dreamed dreams. Uh, Acts uh, uh, 431, they saw visions, and you can see visions. All of these things happen under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. Myth number three, you have to be goofy. You have to be goofy. You know what? One in three people are goofy. Look at your left. Look to your right. Do they look okay? It's not good for you. I'm sorry. Let me just tell you. People who receive 
the Holy Spirit, they don't have to have him to be goofy. If they're goofy, they're just goofy. That's just, you can write that down. I don't know how you write that in your notes, but just put it down. It's a myth. Myth number four, and there's plenty more, but I'm just trying to list some of the main ones. The gifts ceased after Pentecost. They were over. There's, and there are people that believe that. And I have friends that believe this. That, that, and there's probably people that go to church here that believe that. And, and you may believe that next week again, even after I bring this masterpiece of a sermon. You'll <laughs> still believe that. You won't be disfellowshipped for believing that. But I'm just telling you there's scripture and verse to prove that the gifts have not ceased. In chapter 12 and 14 of 1 Corinthians, we're giving a long discourse on how to handle the gifts of the Spirit. So if they were to cease, which I believe the epistles, I could just start naming a few Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Romans, all these letters that were written to the church, why would there be so much time spent on a delineation of how to bring these in proper order if the Holy Spirit, if the, if the activities and the gifts of the Holy Spirit were to cease and be over with and done? Why would there be all this energy spent on how to make sure they're not out of control and wild and crazy? So I believe that alone, along with the fact that you can look at from, it's about six to ten years from the time that the Holy Spirit, he is poured out to the time that Carneas, the Gentile guy in Acts 10. So there's probably from Acts 2 to Acts 10, there's about six to ten years that go on there. And if you can even look at some of the things that happened uh, under the direction of the Holy Spirit that are about 35 years from the time he was originally poured out. So, are you tracking with me? So, wh- why this, did God, at what point did the Father say, okay, enough's enough. You, you, you can receive him in this capacity, but not you. And so, I, I just can't, I can't buy into that. Uh, in Acts 19, Paul finds some disciples at Ephesus, and he asked them if they received the Holy Spirit when they believed. They said, we have never even heard of it. And so this is probably, I, I, if my, my study, and I stand to be corrected on this, is 20 to 35 years somewhere after the initial outpouring. And so in verse 6, the Bible says, and when Paul, in Acts 19, verse 6, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, and there were about 12 men in all. So if you believe these myths, you are badly mistaken. So... To to better understand this, you need to go back to how they got to this place to begin with. If if I'm at a place, I want to know how... We have GPS, right? We have this God-positioning satellite. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's a God-positioning satellite. It kind of keeps us on track to where I should have saved that for the end. It's what happens when you don't have it in your note and the Holy Spirit just drops something on you like that. So, anyway... This God-positioning satellite keeps us on track, but how did we get here? So I'm so glad you asked, how did we get here? How did we get from Acts 2? How, do we, how, how did Jesus prep them for what was about to happen in Acts 2? How did this, if this was the New Testament, if Acts is the book of the, of the beginning of the New Testament church, how did they get there? Well, it all starts with three important chapters in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. And, and you have to listen to the last word. These are Jesus' last words before he, before he leaves us. And you'll see the word in here that's used, helper, over and over. And I'm giving you the preface of this so when I read it, you'll be able to interject this word, advocate. By the way, which is not just a friendly attorney. This is basically somebody that's going to stand in your place. That's what it means. It is a jurisprudence term, but it's not just about about being your attorney. It's about being your go-between. It's about the one you, you, you're, you're tracking with me. So there's a word. This word is paraclete, not parakeet, that repeats everything you say, but paraclete that tells you things you should do and say. All right. So it, it, it occurs five times in the scriptures of John, and it refers to the Holy Spirit as an advocate, as a counselor. And I love this one, and this is one we're going to land on for practical teaching today, and that is helper. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, is a 
He is a helper. Let's go to John 14, verse 12. Are you ready? Truly, truly, Jesus said, hey, 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 listen to me. That's what he's saying. Truly, truly, listen to me. I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Everybody say another helper. This is not some new concoction. This is not some new idea. Remember I told you there's no reason to be afraid of him. But he's going to give you, Jesus has been beside you. But guess what? Things are fixing to get better. In fact, he said it's to your advantage because he's not just going to be beside you. He's about to be in you. Now that's great hope that, that I don't have to, because what if Jesus is out of town? Now he's inside of me. So I will give you another to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Do you believe we need a spirit of truth in this world today? Yeah. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let's go to chapter uh, 14, verse 25. Again, we're talking about the message Jesus is giving his disciples, preparing them for what happens at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. Here's that word. But the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach. Underline that in your Bible if you have a hard copy Bible. It'd be a good thing to underline. He will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. So the trusted voice that's been beside you is about to be teaching you. Let's go to chapter 15, verse 26. A lot of Bible. That's kind of what we do here, right? It is about the Bible. But when the helper, everybody say the helper. The helper. When the helper whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Well, what does this mean? It's testimony. He will bear witness. Everything the helper is saying is about Jesus. Have you ever noticed? In fact, John, in his third epistle, I believe it is, he said, not in the Gospel of John, but in the third, uh, the, one of the epistles of John's writings. It's only one chapter long, uh, shortest, shortest book in the Bible. He said... He said, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. These three are one. So this is not, this is not, we're not teaching some polytheistic idea that there's multiple gods out there. This is the wholeness, all in this one, some like to use the term Trinity, all in this, this triumness, this, this God that's, that's moving and shaping. In fact, the Bible even says this, that from the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. In other words, and the idea and the concept of God and who he was Jesus was already crucified not literally but in, you understand God moves in eternal we move in this little this little minute time piece down here and God God's moving here and we're moving somewhere here and, and so it's why sometimes it's hard to comprehend this. So when he says things, when the Bible scriptures say things like from the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. Well, we, we don't see Jesus flinging stars out into space and speaking light and, and turning that which was void into something that is beautiful and wonderful. We don't see Jesus there crucified. No, not physically, but in the plan, in the blueprint of God, this is what had happened was. This is it. So we see this word teaching, the helper comes who I will send. I'm in verse 26, from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear, he will testify, all these testify of one another. John 16, let's go to the next chapter, 14, 15, 16. So we're hitting the highlights. When you get time, and that is your homework, you'll, you'll hear me say it at the end of this today. Trust me, I won't finish what I need to say. I got more in here than you got here. Or more than you got here, I should say. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not go away. The helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. So a lot of beautiful truth here that we don't have long to. I'm going to hit it in high spots. So you can, if you're taking notes, you can go back and listen and re-listen and re-listen and, go, and download the app so you can get the notes. Uh, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So let me, uh, let's, before I get into this, let's read John 6. So we've covered these chapters here. John 16, 13 and 15. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So what does that mean? That means he will declare truth. So... Let me remind you real quickly of who he's talking to here. These are not the ace players of the kingdom. These are people that said, hey, Jesus, I'll never leave you. And hours later, they're lying and saying, I don't know this man. Uh, These are guys that are stumbling over and over. In fact, over three years, they still couldn't get much right. Uh, over and over, he's saying, do you, do you not get it? I've told you and you still don't get it? At the cross, weren't there 12 that were originally following him? I mean, as disciples, not just followers, but disciplined people. That's what that word disciple, disciplined people. Weren't there 12 disciplined people? And when their best friend needs them the most on the cross being executed, one shows up. So that's who he's talking to in John 14, 15, and 16. And he tells them, you're about to have power that you've never had before. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to receive it. Now... Why is this so important? I'll tell you why it's so important. Because the Holy Spirit, he came on ordinary people and gave them the power to take an extraordinary message to the whole world. They were not ace Christians. They were failures at best. And this is how he can help. Number one, the Holy Spirit will teach you. That's what we read. That's one of the first things he said. He will teach you all things John 14, 26, and bring back to your remembrance all that Jesus said. All that Jesus said. This word remembrance here, when it says that he will bring, this teacher will bring back to remembrance, it's not just something that's a jog, a flash in your brain. It's a recollection. It it, it actually means to make it relevant to you. You understand that? So when it says he will teach you and he will will bring back to remembrance, it's not like, oh, I remember that scripture. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Oh, okay. I feel better. No. It's like at that moment and at that time, the Holy Spirit has the power and wants to help you in this area that in your darkest hole, in your deepest trial, he will say, hey, here's a scripture you've probably never thought of, but it fits right where you are. That's, that's why I've been preaching my guts out before, said a whole lot about a whole lot of things. And when I get through, walk down, and some precious person that's baptized with the Holy Spirit will say to me, Pastor, and I'm thinking, they're going to they're gonna mention that quote I mentioned about the calf. They're going to talk about the calf. And they'll quote some scripture that I didn't use. I think, where did that come from? And the Holy Spirit, you know what? You know what? I'll tell you where that came from. The Holy Spirit said, Mark, would you move out of the way just a minute? I want to talk to them. It's coming out like this. It's about a calf to you, but it's about. And we said, whoo, how did you get that out of that? I don't know. But the Holy Spirit, he, that's what that means. He will teach you. He, basically, it's more than just a remembrance. It's a relevance. He will make the scripture relevant. Re- so when you, when you have the Holy Spirit, that's my cue that I need to quit. <laughs> Lord, help me with my rebellion right now because I want to keep preaching. 
Spirit will teach you all things, John 14, 26. Let's go to the second thing. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. Everything the Holy Spirit does is pointing to the cross. It's pointing to the cross. It's pointing to the redemption. It's pointing to what Christ has done for you. It's, it's not the Holy Spirit. He, watch me, this is very important. He is not some sub-God. He is not some sub-God. He's not some inferior thing. Somebody said, well, he is a he. He's not a, he is a person. He does have a personality. He does feel. He does, that's, how, that's why he can be called a personality. It's because he has all the, uh, the, the, the uh, ingredients and the, and the pieces of what a person. He has emotions. He has senses. He has, all of this happens. And so, but he's not, he's not, somebody said he's not an it. Well, I think there's only one scripture that would make you think that. And the Bible says it fell upon each of them. But that is not a disrespectful term. It's like it's kind of like Mary when she's, she's uh, impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called the holy thing. And there again, it's not, we, we call things things that we don't know what they are. Because nobody had ever experienced what Mary felt. And by the way, as far as I know, nobody's experienced it since. There's one Christ and him crucified, right? But she was overshadowed. See what I'm talking about? From the beginning. It's not just so, it's just where it's allocated now. It's not just reserved to the heavenlies. It's released to the earthy. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. Let me hurry on. The Holy Spirit convicts and convinces. The Holy Spirit convicts. That word convicts. The Holy Spirit in John 16, 8 through 11. When it says it, it will convict. It, it doesn't mean just convict. A better word, term for us in our vernacular is it convinces. It's constantly telling you, no, 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 no. This is what I mean. No, you. Because look, I don't know about you, but I get a little discombobulated in this world. If you ever, I'm just going to be honest. How many of you have second guess sometimes like well wait a minute Lord I've been a Christian for this many years but so I'm wondering about this yeah and I'm not saying second guessing your salvation or your, your but your faith sometimes it, James teaches us this he said we have all kind of King James uses this term it's called diverse temptations if you take that and you and you convert it to what it means in our understanding it's diverse different weird temptations out of the off the wall temptations and it's not about typical temptations it's about you with your faith but it says if I can endure the testing of that I'm made stronger it's kind of like the Pac-Man guy you know eating all those if you eat the right things you're going to get stronger you're going to get more life and so the, the Holy Spirit convince, convicts and convicts he actually convicts four or three things people of their sin the standard of righteousness that Jesus has judged and defeated Satan now why would Jesus need to judge and defeat Satan because Satan is called the accuser of the brethren the reason you feel guilt ridden sometimes that's not the Holy Spirit making you feel guilt ridden that is the accuser of the brethren making you feel that way according to Revelation Revelation said he is the accuser of the brethren the enemy Diablo the devil Lucifer your enemy, the devil going about as a roaring lion, is constantly before the Father saying, they did that. Did you see what they did? Do you see how evil they, do you see they can't get it together? All you paid for them and they can't get it together. Why don't you destroy them? And if you are hearing that voice, you are overriding the power of the Spirit in your life and you're hearing the voice of the enemy. Because the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, is convincing you, you're all right. Grace is sufficient. Yeah, you're going to make mistakes. You might be knocked down, but you're not knocked out. Get up. You can do this. Don't be beaten up. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. In fact, I'm convinced that there's been times in my life that I would have thrown in the towel. But I couldn't find it. Holy Spirit hit it somewhere. <laughs> Keep fighting. You got this. And my trainer's got the towel. And usually it's the trainer that throws in the towel. But he hadn't thrown in the towel. In fact, he's just throwing more grace at me. Man. He convinces, 
convinces and he convicts. The Holy Spirit declares truth. He's constantly, he's constantly announcing to you and to your whole world, this is true. Walk in it. Believe this. When he planned creation, he had you in mind. Look at Ephesians 1, 11 and 12 when you get get a minute. Look at Psalms 139, 15 and 16. He brought you forth on the day you were born, the Bible says. The prophet in the Old Testament said, before you were born, or when you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Now that sounds like a spirit that declares truth about me. I know as I come here on Sunday and the band leads me in worship and I raise my hands or I put my hands in a posture to receive and I get ready to receive. There's things that's going on all week. It's not just a worship service that God is saying about me. He's not worshiping me, but he's declaring truth about me. I, I'm, I am, I'm not near through, but one of my favorite authors of all time is Max Lucado. Have you ever read Max Lucado? If you, I would just like to know what kind of, yeah, so quite a few of you. You're, you're a young younger person you you may not have been introduced to max he's got a brand new book i didn't even know he had it out until this week and and uh most of my sermon was prepped or i would have probably added a whole lot to it but and which would have made me want to go three hours instead of just 30 minutes but max uh max has this new book called Help is here. It's a great book. I highly recommend. I wish I'd have brought a copy of it so you could see it, but it's brand new. I think it's just in hardback right now. I recommend it to everybody. But uh, he tells a story. Max is a West Texas guy, and uh, his dad was in oil and gas, and, and was they had a little modest home in West Texas. I think it was around Midland, and he was uh, three doors to the house, and there was a front door, a back door, and then a garage door. And he said, Dad had, Dad had this ritual at night. The last thing he would do is he would go to the refrigerator, and, and I'm going to really tap into some, some sentiments here, and he would get some cornbread and put it in a glass and put buttermilk in the cornbread and stir it up and scoop it out with a big spoon and eat it. I, now, now, does that interest any of you? It doesn't make me real hungry, but I'll have to be honest. But I would try it, you know, never have it. I'm surprised my dad used to do it. But Max said his dad would eat that, and then he would close the refrigerator and he would go to each of the doors of the house, front door, back door, and the garage door, and he would click, click, click. Then he would methodically go to the center of the small house that they lived in, stand in the middle of the room, and say, the house is safe. You can sleep now. And I think it was two or three boys, and, and it was a, the family would go to sleep. And I just somehow get that image of your father standing in your life locking every door making sure everything's all right in your life and saying you're safe now you can rest Joel said it this way this is the rest wherewith the weary will rest the Holy Spirit is the rest wherewith the weary will rest Father, I don't, I don't know. I know you're talking to everybody because it's the word of God. It will not return void. I don't know what you're saying to each individual here today, but I know you're saying some things. Help us not to get so sidetracked by many of our wrong traditional beliefs that we're not open to the Holy Spirit and what he's trying to do in our lives. So I'm asking you to speak softly right now to your people. Let them love your truth. Let them love your word. Let them verify what I have spoke from the Bible here today as truth. And if it can't be verified, don't even give heed to it. But I believe it can be verified. I believe it can be validated. And so... As you said, pray to the Father in your name. So we pray in Jesus' name that people who want more of you could receive more of you. That they would go home 
and find some private time today, tomorrow, one day this week, sometime, maybe over and over, because the idea is not to just be filled with the Holy Spirit, but to be continuously filled. So, Father, I just think of it this way. I think of it as inhaling daily, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Inhaling daily. Breathe in. Take a deep breath right now. But take a deep breath, deep as you can. Imagine that every day. Imagine breathing in the Holy Spirit and exhaling evangelism. Exhaling works of faith that God wants you to do because you need help. You need help. And He's here to help you. Stop looking at, at Him as some mystic thing way off out in space. He's God. And He wants to help you. So quit trying to do all this on your own. Let Him help you with marriage issues. Let Him help you with financial issues. He's teacher, right? He's a convincer. Let Him declare truth over you and not some bad friend that turned on you is telling you how worthless you are. Let Him declare. Hear Him declaring over you who you are in Christ. So Father, I pray that this word be sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And here's what I need you to say. If, if, if you believe, if you want to receive the word of God in your heart, would you just say this with me? Lord Jesus, I receive this word right now. Seal it in my heart. Bring it back to remembrance when I need it and how I need it. In Jesus' name, amen. River Park, I love you. God's doing a wonderful work in the earth.